Okay, I think we'll go ahead and get started because uh, we have a large virtual audience also. So, uh, and it looks like it is good afternoon, uh, so that's good. Welcome to the 753rd meeting of the Economic Club of New York. I'm Barbara Van Allen, President and CEO of the club. Uh, recognized as the premier nonpartisan forum for discussions on social, economic, and political issues, uh, the club has actually uh, been providing this platform for over a century. We've hosted more than a thousand prominent guests, uh, speakers, and this, of course, uh, this tradition of excellence continues up to today as well. I'd like to extend a warm welcome to students who are joining us virtually from the Zicklin School of Business, Princeton University, Yeshiva University, uh, Sai Sims School of Business, as well as members of our largest ever class of ECNY 2024 fellows, a select group of diverse rising next-gen business thought leaders. For today's program, we're honored to welcome the chair of the Federal Communications Commission, Jessica Rosenmorsel. She's actually the first woman to hold that position. Jessica works to promote greater opportunity, accessibility, and affordability in our communication services. She's a leader in spectrum policy, developing new ways to support wireless services from Wi-Fi to video and the Internet of Things. She's also responsible for developing policies to help expand the reach of broadband to schools, libraries, hospitals, and households all across the country. Named one of Politico's 50 Politicos to Watch and profiled by InStyle Magazine in a series celebrating women who show up, speak up, and get things done, Jessica brings over two decades of communications policy experience and public service to the FCC. Prior to joining the agency, she served as Senior Communications Counsel for the U.S. Senate Committee on Commerce, Science, and Transportation under the leadership of Senator Senator John D. Rockefeller, the fourth, and Senator Daniel uh, Inouye. Before entering public service, she practiced communications law in Washington, D.C. She's a graduate of Wesleyan University and New York University School of Law. The format today will be a conversation in which we're pleased to have Charles Phillips, club trustee and managing partner and co-founder of Recognize, doing the honors of moderating. We'll end promptly at one o'clock and time permitting, they'll take questions from those in the room. As a reminder, this conversation is on the record. We do have media on the line and in the room. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Jessica and Charles to the stage. Well, good afternoon, everyone, you know, in the room and online. We have a, a big turnout today, so this is uh, of interest to a lot of people. I think we all know our lives are pretty much digital now, and uh, this is a person who oversees a lot of that, and so uh, almost anything that we do, I think during COVID, uh, we all learn how important it was to be online and, and uh, what a problem it was if you weren't online as well, and so I think even more so, this is relevant to all of our lives. So, Commissioner, thank you for being here. Uh, let's start off with a little bit before we dive into all the issues about you, how you got here to the FCC. We know you're from the area of Connecticut a little bit and you went to, to law school around here, but how'd you get from law school to doing what you do now? Was that the plan all along? Uh, um, I always feel like when I get asked these things, I should talk about it like it was a master plan rather than <laughs> serendipity. But um, uh, I want to thank you first for uh, having me here today. It's really a treat. Uh, as you mentioned, I, uh, I did previously live in New York. I went to school here. And uh, at some point, my husband suggested we spend a few years in Washington. And I moved there kicking and screaming. Spent a certain amount of time looking for the five boroughs on the Potomac. And, uh, and sometime after that, decided uh, to commit to where I was at. And I went to work for the United States Senate. First, I worked for Senator Inoue, and later for Senator Rockefeller, who was really my sponsor and mentor. And while I was advising him in the Senate Commerce Committee, I 
spent a lot of time thinking about this outstanding recommendation from the 9-11 Commission report. Um, there was a report assessing everything that went wrong that day, and there was this one recommendation that the government had never acted on, which was finding a way for police, firefighters, and emergency medical personnel to ensure they could all talk to one another in a real crisis. So I set about to studying it, and it was sort of personal. My family lost someone in the Twin Towers, and I convinced Senator Rockefeller that if we took back some spectrum we had from broadcasters and auctioned it off and repurposed those airwaves, we'd be able to set up a national authority so that all of our first responders would be using the same facilities. And this idea was a little strange, just a little wacky. Uh, uh, over time, he sold it to then Vice President Biden. And then President Obama put it in the State of the Union as something he wanted to do. So serendipity. <laughs> and uh, shortly thereafter, uh, President Obama first appointed me to the FCC. And um, by the way, that network that first responders use today is called the First Responders Network Authority, and it's up and running. Great. And um, a lot of things that I'm proud of I've been able to do as the first woman at the FCC, but helping uh, emergency personnel in times of crisis is really chief among them. That's fantastic. Um, so let's start on some of the issues. You get some things that are pending and pressing. I mean, you have so many things that are happening right now. But one of the, the biggest ones and probably uh, most controversial is trying to bring back net neutrality. So I have to, we have to start. You went there. right there. Right you there, just went get it right going. There. Okay. Before you yeah. run out of time and run off, let's get to the big ones. Sure. And uh, so it was passed under President Obama in 2015, mm -hmm. repealed by President Trump, and you're trying to bring it back. So can yeah. you give us the status, your thinking, why is this needed now? Of course. Um, I think to set the stage, you, you mentioned this at the start. Try to imagine four years ago, the pandemic. If I made one thing clear about technology, it's that broadband is essential. We were all told to go home, hunker down, and move all of our lives online, work, education, healthcare, all of it. And the curious thing is that the last administration decided that the Federal Communications Commission, the nation's expert on communications, should not have authority over broadband. So, as part of that, they decided that there should be no rules for net neutrality. And net neutrality rules are rules that prevent broadband providers from blocking websites, slowing down services online, or censoring content. Net neutrality rules means there's some oversight of broadband providers so that you as a consumer can go where you want and do what you want online. And so a curious thing happened after the last administration stepped out and decided there'd be no oversight of broadband and no net neutrality rules. The states stepped in. In fact, we've got almost a dozen states that now have net neutrality laws, policies, and executive orders. And so when I took over the agency, the first thing that occurred to me is that broadband's essential. Everyone needs to have it everywhere. And we're gonna have to have some oversight of it because it's so essential. And the second thing that occurred to me is that in a modern digital economy, we can't be having discrete broadband and net neutrality policies in all of our states. We need a national baseline. And so I have recommended to my colleagues we bring that oversight back, bring net neutrality back. And in fact, your timing's impeccable because today's the day that we're gonna release our draft order on net neutrality to the public. So for the interested or sleep, you know, people who can't sleep at night, they'll be up on the FCC's website later today. And what do you say to the telecom vendors who say, if people want to pay more for faster speeds, that's mm -hmm. the market at work. And then how can we plan if you can declare any time that we're being unreasonable? We, we don't know what the rules are. Yeah, I think the thing that is important is that we got to make a distinction between consumer broadband, the stuff you and I get at home, and business broadbands. Uh, I want there to be all kinds of innovation and entrepreneurial activity in the business segments as we figure out how to connect banks, how to connect for healthcare, and very specific purposes. But for the business broadband, that's one segment. For the consumer, it's something else. We want to make sure that you can go where you want and do what you want and not have to pay for special fast lanes or slow lanes on the internet. 
most of the households in this country have only one or two broadband choices. So if your broadband provider mucks around with your traffic, you are um, not able to access the internet fully. So we're gonna put policies in place to make sure that consumer broadband is protected. And that's really the focus of net neutrality policies. Okay, another pending program is the Affordable Connectivity Program, which uh, if it's not renewed by the end of April, I think, uh, a lot of people start to lose the subsidy. But maybe you can explain what that is and why it's running out and how we can fund this. Yeah, um, from one complex topic to the next. All right, um, so you started and I started with the pandemic. I think the pandemic made clear we have a digital divide. And Congress took a look at that and offered billions of dollars to help build broadband infrastructure in places that don't have it. But at the same time, Congress recognized sometimes that digital divide wasn't just about infrastructure. It was about not being able to afford broadband. I mean, in a city like New York, infrastructure was not the primary impediment. So people couldn't afford it. So they sat outside of a fast food restaurant or a shuttered public library to try to meet up with work colleagues or kids do their homework. And so Congress directed us on a bipartisan basis to set up a program called the Affordable Connectivity Program. And uh, right now we have 23 million households that count on this program. It is the largest broadband affordability initiative in our nation's history. It helps low-income households get online and stay online. Uh, if Congress does not continue to fund it after April and part of May, will have to turn to those households and take that support away. And I think many of them will shut off the service. So it's really important for Congress to continue this program. We've come so far to help address the digital divide. We don't want to go back now. So the subsidy, subsidy is $30 a month. Mm -hmm. So part of the criticism you read is that, well, some of those people, they're going to get broadband anyway. Mm -hmm. How do we know they need it? Sure. So how, I guess sure. how do you satisfy yourself on that? Well. Congress was very clear here. Congress told the FCC that if a household gets SNAP, Medicaid, veterans pension benefits, has a child on the free and reduced lunch program at school, that would be a proxy for understanding that they were low income. And so we use that as the criteria to assess. We don't require them to say, you know, what type of service they had in the past. But an interesting fact is we did some survey work with our economists, and we found that of the current ACP households, 68% of them either had no connectivity before or inconsistent connectivity. So a really broad swath of them were vulnerable to having no service. And I think that's important because it demonstrates a lot of need. I think just as important as a conversation I had with a corporate executive about this, who said that this program overnight took the most vulnerable people that he has as customers and made sure they were secure. And by the same token, it took the people we think are most vulnerable in the economy and made them more secure with this connection. So I think that's why we have so much support for this from the business community. We have uh, 26 governors who want to see this program refunded, 174 big city mayors. Um, you know, in Washington, it's rare you get a coalition that big and that diverse, that bipartisan, but support for this program is really, really big, so I hope Congress listens. So of the 23 million people who get the subsidy, 1.8 are in the New York area, yeah. so it affects us. Any tea leaves from Congress, are they, is it moving? Is, are they responding to you? Uh, let's see, the Problem Solvers Caucus, which is a group in the House that's very bipartisan, just came out in support of it. Okay. And I think that that's a useful thing to know. They're a great way to gauge what might make its way through a fairly divided Congress. Uh, we're just gonna keep on being relentless and reminding our colleagues on Capitol Hill how important this program is. So we still have a lot of areas in the country that have uh, coverage issues and uh, you have a number of programs in place. So let's start with the rural broadband coverage. Yeah. Uh, kind of the high cost of deployment there is an issue. Um, I guess I'll bring it up already. So Elon Musk has been trying <laughs> to win <laughs> with through Starlink yeah. some coverage. Sure. That's been in the press lately. You denied him coverage. Mm -hmm. Can you explain your thinking? What sure. happened there? Um, 
Well, you're absolutely right. We have areas that have service and areas that don't. And one thing I'm very proud of under the FCC, under my leadership we've done, is we finally have good maps that say where service is and is not. We've taken all kinds of um, data and incorporated it in a public map that reflects. Although the telecom operators are complaining about the map too, yeah. the, that it's not accurate. We keep, yeah, we, we update it every six months. We've okay. invited them to offer their complaints to us and we tweak it when we hear them. But we also tweak it when we hear from customers who say, I can't actually get this at my address. Right. So we are embracing crowdsourcing to keep this data set updated. My goal is that it uh, outlasts my tenure, but also that federal, state, and local officials can use it to understand where gaps are in service. You need to use that map to decide where to invest. That's I mean, you, like, you know, it's the truism. You can't manage what you don't right. measure, right. and it is extraordinary, but it's true that uh, in the past, the FCC would be doling out money with having a, without having a particularly good grasp of where service is and is not. But back to um, the individual you mentioned. <laughs> Let's see, uh, at the end of the last administration, uh, there was an auction to provide funds to carriers that were willing to serve some of those unserved areas. We had hundreds of them win, but it was structured as a two-phase process. About two weeks before the election, the last administration came out with a preliminary list of winners. Then I inherited the job of doing the financial, legal, and technical review of that preliminary list. And about a dozen of them, we found that they either didn't have the financing or the technical ability to actually meet the criteria in the program. In some cases, they were tiny little entities. In some cases, they were large ones. And um, while uh, low Earth orbiting satellites are extraordinary, I mean, a geopolitical win for the United States and revolutionary in their ability to help us reach everyone everywhere, the uh, repeated technical testing by our engineers found that they couldn't consistently deliver the upstream and downstream required for this program. Um, it has capacity constraints. So before you give out a billion dollars of taxpayer money, you're going to make sure that they meet every single criteria. And, you know, added to our decision making was the fact that there were about 6,500 census blocks where the last administration had awarded funds to this company where there was already service, like traffic medians, the Chicago Loop, Newark International Airport, I'm not sure which direction is from here. Uh, and we went to them and asked them to take it off because we didn't want to be funding places that were already served, mm -hmm. and they refused. So. Uh, you're real careful when you're giving out uh, taxpayer funds and you got to meet the criteria in the program. doesn't matter if you are a small company or a company owned by one of the wealthiest people on the planet. Yeah. So to be clear, this is a technical decision just based mm -hmm. on the marriage. So of course. I should have mentioned the Wall Street Journal had an article saying it's because they didn't use union labor. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> they, the they are free to read our documents <laughs> and learn otherwise. I mean. Look, there's a lot of decisions yeah. you make. Uh, it's a good thing to put down social media and sometimes some editorial pages. But the fact is they have not brought us to court. Yeah. And if they really believed that we were wrong on these facts, on the law or our technical assessment, they could certainly take us to court. They haven't done so. Well, let's talk about just these programs in general. Um, the GAO says there are 15 agencies that fund over 100 different programs for broadband yeah. development around the country. So. Is that the right approach? Would you favor a dedicated agency? Should it be you consolidated? What's, what's the plan uh, here? Yeah, that number's crazy. <laughs> I mean, if I had a magic wand, if any of us did, we wouldn't organize it that way, would we? Yeah, no, no. no. Um, so the one thing that I have tried to do is take advantage of the FCC's technical and historical expertise in this environment. That's why we've built the biggest data set for where broadband is and is not. That's why we've engaged with state broadband offices across the country. That's why I have a memorandum of understanding with all the other agencies that have broadband programs, compelling them to start using my data. That's why we're also trying to produce a map of which agencies are funding what so that we don't actually overlap with scarce resources. So while I'd like to have a magic wand and make that all simpler, I think we're tr trying to do a credible job of uh, making sure everyone coordinates and rows in the same direction. 
Uh, another question about access. So you announced something called a digital discrimination rule, I guess, something like that. And there are a fair amount of people who are skeptical saying, we understand wanting everybody to have access, but the way it was written, mm -hmm. you, you can't say disparate impact, you can say disparate mm -hmm. treatment, but not impact. So how do you kind of balance this yeah. delicate thing? And So in the bipartisan infrastructure law, when Congress was setting aside billions of dollars for broadband deployment, it also developed what I think is the first bipartisan uh, law, digital civil rights law, which is a direction to the FCC to facilitate equal access to broadband and prevent digital discrimination. It specifically calls out uh, communities by income, race, ethnicity, color, religion, and national origin and come up with policies to prevent discrimination. So that's a kind of new task for the FCC. Yeah. We'd never been asked to do those kind of things before. So my first inclination was to do a whole lot of work. We brought in civil rights experts, people who we had not traditionally had at our agency in the past. We held public fora in Kansas, California, Maryland. Uh, we tasked a committee that we have to study these things. We built a really big record. And what we learned was to give full meaning to that law, we were gonna to have to look at both discriminatory intent and disparate impact. But we also were really thoughtful when we implemented it. We allow anyone to file a complaint with us, but we're gonna investigate it before we move forward. And we've made very clear to the companies that genuine reasons that are based on technical limitations or economic limitations are reasonable defenses to any claims of digital discrimination. And we've also put out a lot of resources to help companies manage this new law. Now, there's still folks who would like us to uh, overturn what Congress asked us to do. And uh, in the fall, we will have oral argument in the Eighth Circuit. So stay tuned. So you have, have you seen the company start to change decisions and change behaviors based on? We're trying to talk to them. I mean, look, in the end of the day, when I think about this, facilitating equal access to broadband and preventing dis digital discrimination, the goal isn't to penalize companies. The goal is to fix a problem. And so I am trying very hard to create a cooperative environment because we want to fix the problem. That's the most important thing. Okay, let's turn to some security and privacy issues, data privacy, um, another big topic. Yeah, I know, we're just bouncing <laughs> we have so from much thing time to thing. We gotta, yeah. get, we gotta get all of them in. I know, I know. <laughs> um, you have made some announcements on how to uh, ban certain products that are made by Chinese-owned companies as part of our infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Um, how pervasive is that? Yeah. yeah, I think it's a couple companies you've mentioned so far, but how did you come to that conclusion? Were you guys monitoring and seeing something and kind of how, how much it would be worried, I guess? Yeah. Um, well, we have concluded with the help of our national security counterparts that there is Chinese network infrastructure that is fundamentally insecure. Uh, that includes network uh, equipment from companies like Huawei and ZTE. And by the way, we're not alone here. Our engineering and geopolitical counterparts in Australia, Japan, the UK, Germany, and other places have concluded the same. So at the FCC, we've been fairly aggressive about trying to help get this stuff out of our networks and out of our economy. Uh, first, we are helping the smallest carriers that have it in their networks. We're actually paying for them to move it out and replace it. Second, we made very clear that if we have funding programs, you are not allowed to buy, take public dollars to buy this equipment. And then we have programs where we authorize equipment in the United States and we're gonna exclude equipment from those manufacturers. But I think it's just as important that we're trying to champion the development of new equipment markets in the United States with more secure equipment using new technologies like open radio access networks. So our goal is to get rid of the insecure stuff and help build more secure markets um, that are centered on US experiences and US software know-how with the next generation of communications equipment. On the uh, data privacy side, the perception is we're kind of way behind Europe. They've been aggressive on this GDPR and other standards they came up yeah. with. How would you compare our approach to theirs and should we be doing more of what they're doing? Oh my gosh, they're so different. Um, 
They're so different, they're almost impossible to compare. When I look at Europe, they have a broad general privacy policy that comes out of Brussels that gets applied by the member states to every single sector of the economy. When I look at the United States, our approach is always sector specific. When it comes to banking, we have Graham Leach Bliley. When it comes to healthcare, we have laws like HIPAA. When it comes to young people in communications, we have laws like the uh, Communications Online Privacy Protection Act. When it comes to your communications activity, we have policies preventing them from selling who you call, when you call, and where you are when you make phone calls. So in the United States, we have chosen a very different route to date than our European counterparts, which is all based on expectations in a specific sector of the economy. Now, as we digitize everything in the economy, it gets harder and harder to understand how those rules apply. And there certainly has been conversation in Congress about the need for a national privacy law, but I don't think we're quite at the point where that's about to pass. Yeah. Yeah. Um, speaking of privacy, one of the news items on CNBC a lot lately has been the car makers, yeah. automobile companies collecting information we didn't know they were collecting. Uh, maybe you can describe what they're collecting about us. How did you find this out? Right. And then kind of what, how does this, this oh get resolved? Well, um, good for me, but maybe not for you. I have an old car. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's uh, in the last several years, our cars have turned into smartphones on wheels. They know where you're going, what you're doing, what you're doing in the car. They keep those records. And the New York Times has done a pretty phenomenal job of trying to identify what it means to have a smart car with all this connectivity. I mean, sure, they provide lots of benefits. Like, they can call for emergency help even if you don't have a phone and you're not capable of reaching them. Oh, they can help you find your car in a parking lot that looks infinite. You could turn it on remotely. But what are they doing with all that data? Who's overseeing it? And early in January, the New York Times did a description of a very specific problem, which was survivors of domestic violence were finding that they were being tracked and surveilled by their abusers through their cars. Wow. So one in four women in the United States uh, is a survivor of domestic violence, one in seven men. And so I looked at that and I thought about a law we just implemented in the last year called the Safe Connections Act. It worked with Congress to help make it possible for a survivor of domestic violence to get off a family plan in 48 hours, right? Because that means their abuser can't watch where they go, what they do. It's a lifeline to building their life safely and separately. And um, it's a terrific new law. Got lots of support from the National uh, Hotline for Domestic Violence. And the more I looked at that law, I thought, oh, we solved it for smartphones, but we haven't thought about what it means for cars. And the New York Times had just done this extraordinarily well-researched piece of journalism about what was happening. So I wrote all the car manufacturers and asked about what types of connectivity was in their cars. Were they complying with certain laws? What did they think about them? And I think what was really striking is that um, some manufacturers photocopied the manual and sent us something back. But others made a really detailed effort to try to tell us how they were wrestling with these issues. And um, it's rare that you approach industry as a regulator in Washington and see them scattered all over the map, mm. which tells you there's an issue here. Right. They haven't aligned to organize themselves around. And that's a possibility to me to make sure we have better policies. So I think uh, at the start of next week, we'll start a rulemaking that will be public asking if the Safe Connections Act applies to cars and how we can think about making sure that people are not surveilled using their vehicles. Now that's just the tip of the iceberg. I know that Senator Markey and some others have complained about the use of this data and have requested broader oversight from my colleagues at the Federal Trade Commission. But I think if we can focus on the geolocation issues and the vulnerabilities for survivors from domestic violence, we're actually gonna do some good for everybody. How do you think of kind of consumer data generally? Should we have more control over it? Should we be compensated for that? I mean, is there a model for that? Yeah, um, I don't think that we've evolved enough on this. I mean, we're all pumping out so much data about ourselves everywhere we go. 
And yet when they survey us, we're like, do you care about privacy? Absolutely. You know, the gap between stated preferences and revealed preferences here is really big. Yeah. I'm astonished at how much I'll like give up to save 10 cents in certain environments. We've gotten so acclimated to it. And I'm also astonished at how despite all my training, I'll try to order something online and there's this long list of terms and services. And I just tick the box, yes, because, you know, free shipping, right? Right, right. right. not going to read all that. No, yeah. no. Um, so I think, we, um, I think we have to figure out how to make all of this more clear and more simple. And on that front, I think we have a lot of work to do. Speaking of critical data that we must have, TikTok, I uh, have to ask. So one of your <laughs> yeah. commissioners yeah. Uh, came out pretty aggressively and said we should be on TikTok, but we haven't seen you say anything <laughs> yet or an official position. Well, it's definitely not within our purview under the Communications Act, right? Because we deal with communications networks and networking equipment. But many of those same vulnerabilities we've been able to identify in Chinese networking equipment leave me also concerned about TikTok. And my hope is that the bill that recently passed in the House makes its way to the president so he can sign it. Good. Okay. Another big topic, artificial intelligence. Oh my God. Deep fakes. <laughs> I don't think you have any small topics. No, no, no. You, you no. don't have yeah, any no, small no, jobs. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, fake video, fake voice. We have an election coming up. People don't know what to believe anymore. So what's the FCC's role in? Oh my gosh. Yeah, artificial intelligence will touch every aspect of our economy. Um, but let's bring it back to something that just happened more recently. In the New Hampshire uh, primary election, maybe you read about this, a lot of voters got a call from the President of the United States with some misinformation about where and when to vote. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, he's a public figure. It takes about 10 minutes to use his voice and produce something artificial. This was a clear shot across the bow and very concerning. So I'm really proud at the FCC that we stared at our laws, which are old on this subject, and uniformly came out very clearly and said that this violates the Telephone Consumer Protection Act because this is uh, the kind of activity that is artificial and pre-recorded voice. And using the technology we have through our traceback coalition, we were able to identify what, what carrier was carrying that and stop them from carrying it. And then we turned to our colleagues in the New Hampshire Attorney General's office and said, here's where we think it's coming from. And the New Hampshire Attorney General went after the individual. Uh, we did all this in record time uh, and made a very clear public statement that was very bipartisan that we have to deter this stuff. What I'm scared about is it could all happen at a scale, but we won't be able to do that in the future. And um, that's something that as an economy and as a democracy, we're going to have to wrestle with and figure out how to address. It's hard to prevent it at that scale, but are there any laws you're thinking of already have that would acquire labeling or notification or anything? Yeah, I mean, we have a very substantial executive order from the president on artificial intelligence. We have a lot of interest in Congress, but not a lot of new laws. But when I think about hard problems, my inclination is always to say, well, where do you start? And I think where you start with artificial intelligence is it needs to announce itself to you. If it is being used, it should be public. And failure to make public that fact um, should be a violation of the law. So to me, announcing itself to you, finding a way to be transparent about that is the first and most important step. Does the FCC have any tools to monitor this and be more? Well, we're, I think we're going to see more of these junk robocalls, and we're going to see um, probably some more uh, disturbing efforts to try to come up with fraudulent stuff during the campaign season. Uh, I think the bulk of that will be over the internet and so outside of our purview. But we are having conversations about this and talking to our colleagues at the Federal Election Commission about it to make sure we're all aligned. Okay, I'm going to ask a couple more, and then we're going to go to the audience okay. and we give them time to get their questions ready. Yeah. Uh, I want to pivot to uh, kind of media ownership and concentration. We used to have all these rules about yeah. not owning too many television stations or newspapers in the same market. Now all of them are in trouble just because of the internet, newspapers, local TV stations, and it might make more sense to consolidate now than it did 20 years ago. So. 
how have, has the law changed? How do you view that? How do you monitor it going yeah. forward? Um, I mean, this is so challenging to even understand what we mean when we talk about media now. Yeah. I mean, there was a time, and it wasn't that long ago, when it meant the newspaper that reached you on your doorstep in the morning, and then it meant my family sitting in front of the, like, basking in the glow of the television screen at 6.30 at night. Uh, those days are gone. I mean, right now we look for uh, news, content, entertainment, and information when we want it, where we want it, on any piece of glass that's handy. That is um, radical change. Of course, our laws haven't really kept up with all of that. And at the FCC, we have policies associated with helping cable channels ensure that they can negotiate for carriage on cable and satellite packages. We also have a lot of policies around broadcasting because you know radio stations and television stations use public frequencies and we manage the public airwaves. Um, over time, the FCC has changed its policies on this. You know, for instance, uh, a newspaper and television station can now combine in any city. We have said we're willing to entertain in markets where uh, multiple stations might be interested in the same owner. We've also uh, entertained all kinds of sharing arrangements where stations might share facilities because it's more cost effective. Ultimately, though, Congress put into the law a 39% cap. No station group can own more stations that reach more than 39% of the national audience. And uh, it's up to Congress to change that law. But I do want to just acknowledge that the thinking of Congress in setting that stat cap was that we do better when we have media sources that are competitive and local and more diverse. And the idea was that television and radio stations shouldn't all be owned by the same company in, in each market. And that diversity and competition really helped uh, make those facilities uh, local and valuable. But uh, Congress may take another fresh look at that. Uh, I think the FCC has evolved its rules over time to try to reflect this new environment we're in, which is, of course, challenging. And I assume the foreign ownership ban, that's something you still support going forward. Yeah, um, I think it's very important to understand with broadcasting, you're talking about a license to use the public airwaves of the United States. So there have long been restrictions in the laws about making those facilities available to foreign governments or foreign affiliated individuals or companies. Right. Well, back to our earlier question, if you view TikTok as a media news platform, could that be foreign ownership? Yeah, so I think, um, I think it's actually just highlights what we've just been talking about, right? Yeah. Like I have these very stringent rules, like I try to imagine a world where a Chinese government entity came to us and asked if they can take over the local, two local t t television stations in New York. I think you know, without being a politician, <laughs> that the answer is gonna be no, right? right? You can't do that under the Communications Act. We're not taking our public airwaves and the capacity to broadcast to vast portion of the American public and handing it to a foreign government. And yet, what do we have? Maybe 110, 120 million monthly active users on TikTok? Yes. But those same policies don't apply right there demonstrates the gap between new media and old media and the values we had in our old policies that we have not applied to the new. Do you think that gets resolved where we view it at all as just communication at some point? Um, I think uh, for many of us what we do with our eyeballs and with our ears is we treat a lot of those sources equivalently but the law doesn't do that right now. Yeah. Okay, let's go to the audience and see if we have some questions. <clears throat> Just a quick question on apps, Instagram, Facebook, they're all free, technically, mm -hmm. right? I guess when you think about protecting a consumer, I mean, why isn't education just more important, right? Your data is being shared, right? Because I know laws are hard to pass. Mm -hmm. but why not just educate individuals when you're signing on that you require Disclosure, very upfront, not like the uh, fine print we get yeah. for credit card statements, et cetera. But just explaining that that's how Facebook makes money. They're yes. giving you this free, they're getting your data, they're sharing it. 
all the car companies want to become, as you said, smart cars or mm -hmm. smart place because they can't sell cars anymore. So they're going to sell technology mm -hmm. and your location, et cetera. But I guess the point is all of these apps are free. Mm -hmm. I guess uh, I'm kind of taken back by the assumption is it's really, it's really not free. And, and why hasn't anybody really just expressed that basic thing? A technology company we have to run data yeah. behind this to control those apps every day. So you have to give them something to get something. Yeah. Yeah. Listen, I think you're absolutely right. I should also acknowledge that at the FCC, we're really the engineering nerds who work on the network level. We don't work on the apps. That would be my colleague, Lena Khan at the FTC. But I think you're fundamentally right about the idea that we need to understand this better. And I think that the disclosures that are presently offered are inadequate. Um, I'll give you an example of something we're working on where I'm trying to think a lot about transparency and simplicity when it comes to disclosure. I think the government doesn't do enough on that. I think we always like handing it off to a lawyer who's got like footnotes and footnotes and footnotes and boxes you should tick and we're all exasperated. So I've tried to think about a government disclosure that really works, and I came back to this. If you go to the grocery store, you can compare carbohydrates and calories really easily. Those iconic black and white labels, like we've all used them. We all know what they look like. So starting this month, we're gonna make every broadband provider have a broadband fax that's modeled off that. I'm not sure if that's gonna be perfect or ideal, but I think we have to spend a lot more time figuring out how we convey just what you said in a simpler format. I don't think we're doing that adequately right now. Thank you. This is very interesting. Uh, my question is towards the, the content creation and, and how we are publishing and showcasing on the TVs. So last week I was in, during the spring break, I went to Florida, uh, Orlando, very specific and I want to watch the Oppenheimer movie, realizing there's a disclaimer saying that, uh, watch out for the kids around because it's a very strong language. I switched off. Uh, return is the same thing. I, I saw a lot of kids around in the flight, so I switched off mm -hmm. that particular movie. Realizing that when you come home and watching the Netflix, there's no filter, there's no <laughs> censorship. And how come the, well, the FCC or, I mean, even if you go to the movie theater, yeah. there's censorship and PG-13, right. all the good stuff that happens. But unfortunately, if you switch on the Netflix, I'm sure, mm -hmm. uh, I, I teach one of the uh, business schools, I wrote a case study on the Netflix, and I strongly suggested the Netflix subscription fees uh, globally, how they increase. Now mm -hmm. I'm realizing the content creation of those Netflix or any other, other outlets there's no censorship. Mm -hmm. Even the kids can watch just Netflix. Yeah. And, and how do you? Uh, so this is really a byproduct of history, what you're describing. The FCC has historically had authority over broadcast airwaves. So the television stations that use the 600 megahertz band to reach us in our homes are using a public facility. And being able to use that facility puts them in a position of public trust. So my predecessors, long ago, like back in the Kennedy administration, uh, started a policy where they had duties if they used that public resource, including ones that would um, limit obscenity and profanity uh, over the television screen. You know, um, you can, um, you know, people, some people will criticize those policies as retrograde, but as a parent, you know, I, I continue to see some value in them. And I'm also struck by how in many other environments, like online and um, in all these other new services, they don't really exist. Uh, I think that that gap between one mode and the other gets harder and harder to defend because if you ask my kids, they don't know the difference between a television channel where they're watching, a cable channel where they're watching something that's online. It's just stuff to watch but they do have very different legal and regulatory histories, and that's why, there's those, that's why those differences are present. Thank you. Hi, hey, thank you so much for, for your time here. For, really interesting. Um, just a question regarding the Affordable Connectivity Act. Um, you know, I, I know as a millennial, um, 
you know, when I go on the internet, sometimes I get lost, you know, besides the Wall Street Journal and other sites, I'm lost on Facebook and YouTube and everything else. So is there any talks with the Department of Education? You know, if you do decide, you know, the law passes and everybody in low income neighborhoods gets internet access, mm -hmm. is there any talks with the Department of Education to try to have some sort of educational guidance? Um, because I know a lot of kids are on Instagram and creating their own YouTube mm -hmm. channels. Um, is, is, so again, the question is, is there any talks with the Department of Education to help out lower income um, mm -hmm. folks in the United States? So we haven't been asked to do that formally within the law, but I've done work and traveled with Secretary Cardona talking about just that. Um, there's good stuff on the internet. There's extraordinary junk. We can be passive consumers or we could be powerful creators. And I think we have a lot of work to do to try to figure out how to expand that creativity and um, limit the, you know, uh, the stuff that's less enriching and less worthwhile. Uh, we're not educators, so I don't want to suggest that we really understand what that curricula looks like. But I'm certain that modern educators think about that all the time in schools as they teach media literacy and media training, and it's never been more important that they do so. Thank you. Question here about um, a national security kind of an issue that has to do with um, the next few months, the attacks that are coming, not just through cars or TikTok, but directly on all communication channels from outside sources mm -hmm. that are, have told us they're coming, in fact, they are coming now, mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's going to be an aggressive campaign. And what do you see your role in this, in identifying the sources? Uh, it's hard to, as at one point in time you had suggested, that privacy is, uh, and the First Amendment mm -hmm. are critically challenging issues to deal with. But what about identifying the sources, location of where they come mm -hmm. from, and making the local folk really uh, define themselves clearly to your satisfaction? Mm -hmm. Or what's your role as the AFCC yeah. in combating this over the next six, seven months? So there's this issue, and then there's the role of the FCC. Let me just explain the limitations of my role. If, for instance, a radio station decides to lease its time out to Sputnik. I demand that they disclose that fact in their filings and at the time of air, because I want to have the kind of disclosure you describe. But I would also say that those disclosures on traditional broadcast media, like television stations and radio, are necessary, but ultimately not sufficient, because the universe of media is broader and vaster and frequently running online. So we are going to have to uh, work to identify that stuff. And by we, I mean we as the public. It's not the role legally of the FCC. What I am actually really worried about is that we're flooding the zone with so much junk that even individuals who want to sort through it and find out what's factually true wind, themselves, wind up like um, subject to this dividend of deceit, which is that we all just get exasperated and we stop trying to sort through what's true and false. And I'm as worried about the false stuff as that kind of dividend and what it does to our culture and people who are inclined to try to, you know, sort through things and find out what's true. I think that's a huge problem. We've yet to really address it. I'll ask one last question before we have one over here. Go ahead. It will be the last. Uh, hi. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank you for your advocacy for the consumer. Um, I wrote an open letter to the FCC um, under Ajit Pai, and um, as you're probably aware, he was a lobbyist for Verizon. It seemed like it was a very pro-telco administration. Um, my name is Michael Turpin. Um, I'm well known for my lawsuit against AT&T when I was sim swapped for $24 million and the case, uh, which is now in front of federal appeals courts, I got thrown out um, awaiting, I guess, the Chevron Supreme Court uh, decision um, on whether sort of current um, interpretations of uh, CPI and CPNI would apply, you know, to 1996 regulations. For me to even, I just want a fair trial. 
in Los Angeles. Um, I guess my question, this sort of background, um, is I noticed that my, my case was uh, referenced a few times in the uh, thing that I asked for in 2019 of the last administration, which was just clear regulation of the telcos on what their responsibilities are in protecting the consumer in a world of, um, you know, SIM swaps are, 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 are rampant. And um, I know you proposed legislation, or sorry, regulation, and it seems like it's been hampered by the lobbying of the telcos. And the, just like an update on that, please. Yeah, on um, SIM swapping fraud in particular? Yeah, we actually changed policies to try to prevent it. I think they haven't fully gone into effect yet, but it's way too easy for someone to call up your phone company and try to convince them they are who, you know, they're, they might be you and get them to take that dime size. Or to chip bribe an employee, phone. which usually happens. Yeah, a dime size chip in your phone and transfer it. And then all of a sudden they can use two factor authentication, drain your bank accounts, take over your social media. This is a huge source of fraud. So we have uh, adopted new rules that would require the carriers to do many more things before they transfer any type of SIM. Um, I would like to watch those rules go into effect and see if we need to continue to update them over time. Because one thing I've learned is that um, scam artists, they are nimble. They find new ways constantly. And so we got to make sure we keep up. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. With that, we'll turn it back over to Barbara. Right, thank you both. What a great <laughs> conversation. So we have many great speakers uh, ahead of us. I just I want to share real quickly, next week, April 11th, we have Susan Collins, the President and CEO of the Boston Fed. She'll be in a conversation with former club trustee, Abby Joseph Cohen. Uh, April 16th, we have Francois Villeroy de Gaulle. He is the governor of the Bank of France. Uh, again, April 16th. On April the 23rd, we have Jamie Dimon coming, uh, and, and that is proving to be a popular event. If you've not gotten your seat, I encourage you to do so. And on April 30th, we have Jared Bernstein, who's the chair of the Council of Economic Advisors. Looking forward to May, we have the founder and president of the History Makers, Juliana Richardson, for a webinar May 2nd. We have Dr. Ed Yardini on May the 21st. May 30th, we actually have a luncheon featuring our chair uh, and, of course, chair of the New York Fed, John Williams. All these events uh, are listed on the website. Be sure to review uh, the website now and then as we do add, uh, as you all know, as, as we move forward. And finally, I'd like to take a moment to thank those members of the Centennial Society that are here today because their financial contributions provide the financial backbone for the club and enable us to do our programming. So thank you to all that are attending today. And uh, for those that are virtual, we'll say goodbye. We hope we'll see you. Uh, next week. And for those in the room, please enjoy your lunch. Thank you.